Congratulations. Welcome everybody and uh, welcome to those that are attending uh, this uh, technical uh, lecture from the internet. The internet. Uh, this uh, technical lecture uh, is being organized by the South East England and London Home Counties branch of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. My name is Maria Kubura and I work here as Senior Technical Advisor. Um, Bijou George uh, fortunately couldn't uh, be with us today and he sends his apologies. I'm uh, happy to see some familiar faces uh, today and uh, particularly delighted uh, that uh, Dr. Josh uh, Matekel is with us today. I'm conscious about the time, so I will start uh, with a few words about our speaker. Uh, Dr. Jos Matekal is currently the Head, Technical Cooperation, Coordination and Major Projects Section of the IMOS Marine Environment Division. He's also the Chief Technical Advisor to the IMOS Globalist Program. And he's going to talk uh, today about, about IMOS Global Projects to address greenhouse gas emissions from the marine maritime sector. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Marina, uh, for having me here, and uh, it's extremely honored to be here once again, I'm honest. Um, extremely humbled to be here, seeing all the, the, the audience here and uh, some of the expertise within this room. Um, and uh, my talk today is not going to be very technical, if you were expecting a very deep technical talk from me. It is going to be about uh, the initiatives of IMO, uh, in the last few years um, addressing the issue of climate change, energy efficiency and emissions from the shipping. Um, and there are a couple of projects I would highlight, uh, but it's not going to be a technical talk, I have to admit. Um, so what I would like to cover today is the, the, some of the regulatory drivers, if you're not uh, that familiar with what is happening in IMO, and also maybe some latest updates from the MEPC uh, 70 that happened uh, in, 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 in uh, October. Um, and then we can move on to what IMO has been doing in responding to one of the issues of capacity building and technology transfer, which was a big demand for many countries. Um, and also um, some of the major global projects that I will detail a little bit more and perhaps also see whether we can also look for some opportunities of partnership. And uh, Daniel and Marina, I know that uh, we have some global audience here too uh, listening to us. So welcome to this show uh, on behalf of Um Thank you for uh, being with us, uh, the global audience. Um, um, IMOs uh, two conventions, the main con fundamental convention, SOLAS and MARPOL, and I don't need to go into this uh, conventions. MARPOL is the one that we are going to focus on, the convention that uh, talks about or deals with the prevention of pollution um, uh, from, from ships. Um, and the Annex 6 of this convention, um, you know the other annexes, Annex 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, dealing with all of the pollutions, but Annex 6, talking about air pollution and energy efficiency, which ended into force around in 2005. And uh, we then added, the IMO community then added a new chapter to this Annex 6, um, <coughs> and that was dealing with the energy efficiency issues. And that uh, ended into, was adopted in 2012, and in a year's time, it ended into force on 1st of January 2013. And as many of you know, that was the first ever mandatory global energy efficiency standard for international shipping. In fact, the first industry sector to have adopted such a, such a regulations. Um, and IMO community uh, has been quite uh, you know, proactive in that sense and accelerated that process very fast. Um, now, this convention is applicable for uh, international ships and uh, of more than 400 GT. The two main uh, elements of this, this, this requirement, one is the, the energy efficiency design index for the ships, for the new ships, so the ships are able to meet that particular index with the new design, so they, be, they are energy efficient. 
And of course, all the ships that are in operation should have a ship energy efficiency management plan, the SEAM, the so-called SEAM. Um, and basically, by addressing this or regulating this, uh, these aspects, we are covering almost 85% of the GHG emission from international shipping. Um, so EDI and SEAM are the focus of this, uh, these requirements. Um, I'm not going to go into this very complex formula of how to calculate the EDI or the, the, you know, how to develop a plan, but it's just a summary of we have EDI for the new ships, we have the same for the existing ships, and there is a energy efficiency operation indicators for measuring the performance uh, of the ship. Danny, okay, it, it had disappeared from the screen. Um, so basically, um, the the GHG um, emission studies of IMO concluded that if we apply both EDI and the same by 2050, we could probably achieve a reduction of almost 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. Um, that's a significant contribution in the reduction of, of, of GHG emissions um, um, from the maritime sector. And um, and, and that's what the study says, and that's why the IMO community adopted these two measures, EDI and the SEM. Um, moving on from there, um, IMO very recently also uh, adopted this three-step approach because discussions went on to, okay, how efficient or how effective the SIM are, um, and, and the decision was taken then that we would have a data collection reporting system um, for the ships, which means the ships would have to collect the data on their fuel consumption and report it uh, to the respective flags. The next would have been, an so that, that data would probably give the basis for um, a, a very good analysis of the effectiveness of these measures, because unless we know what is happening, we will not be able to see uh, how to improve it. So data collection was um, then adopted as a first step. Moving on to data analysis, once we have a few years of data on fuel consumption, we can go to data analysis, and that would give us, uh, you know, we can then use it for some informed decision making on what further measures are required in the future to address the emissions issues from shipping. So this was a three-step approach which was adopted by uh, MEPC in 68. Um, but in October this year, a few more development happened, and one was the data collection reporting system on fuel consumption became mandatory because it was adopted by the last MEPC that all the ships uh, would have to now collect the data, report to the flag state, and the flag state would have to verify and then send it to IMO at the central database. So that is now mandated now. Um, IMO, related to that, IMO has also developed a guideline for developing the SIM. When we had the SIM in the first place, um, they didn't have the data collection component there. But now we have data collection as a mandatory thing. The SIM should include the data collection aspect as well. So there is a guideline um, in developing this energy efficiency management plan, and that is also adopted by the last MEPC in October. There is also work in progress, which is some guideline for the administrative data verification. The flag states who are collecting the data to be verifying it and and there are some guidelines being developed and also there are some guidelines welcome hi also some guidelines being developed um, on how IMO is going to have this database managed at, at, a, at, a, at a global level and this is still work under progress um, there is a correspondence group set up by IMO and that will report to the next MEPC uh, in next year uh, on these guidelines and more importantly, IMO community has agreed to develop a roadmap, a comprehensive IMO strategy for the reduction of GHG emissions from shipping. And this talks about the future, how in the future IMO as a community or the sector is going to address um, uh, energy efficiency issues. Um, and that is expected to be adopted around 2018. So we may see some a, a strategic roadmap for IMO for the future. We don't know how it looks like, but it is going to be there. At least we, we, we began the journey through the EDI and SIM process where at least we can try to uh, control some of these emissions. 
But now I'm moving to some of the barriers for implementation of these regulations right now with respect to EDI and especially with the SEM. Of course, the, the global nature of shipping and uh, a, a large number of stakeholders, I can't think of any other industry sector, we have the multiple large number of players involved. So that itself is actually one of the hurdles. Um, all kinds of ships, different types of ships, solutions are different. And especially the split incentive <clears throat> for between the ship owners, the ship operators, the charters, who is going to benefit from the investment. So that is, uh, that's a, a barrier too. And the developing countries have been um, saying a number of years that, you know, that the access to technologies, technology flow, technology transfer is also an issue for many of them to implement these regulations. And there is a general lack of capacity in many of the developing countries to implement these regulations. So uh, there are uh, quite a large number of barriers um, that we need to overcome for countries to start implementing uh, things. And no wonder the developing countries, um, in, the, in the debate of the adoption of the climate change, uh, uh, the energy efficiency um, regulations in IMO, um, stress a lot on the need of technical cooperation and technology transfer. And in a way, I think that brought the consensus in the House where uh, it allowed the countries to sign and adopt the convention, the, the MAP Annex 6. And central to that is this resolution that actually um, um, you know, uh, encourage the member states and parties to collaborate, to share uh, information, allow technology transfer, create enabling environment for technology transfer. And that is uh, central to the implementation of this of these regulations. Now, how do I more react to it? Um, of course, that's the pathway we saw in terms of capacity building and technology transfer. Um, from the regulatory side on the first block, moving on to awareness raising um, in many parts of the world and trying to build the basic capacity in many countries. So the first block on, um, and, and then moving on to more towards institutionalizing such capacity building and technology transfer efforts. So that's the kind of a pathway we saw, and that's how we, 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 we began, um, especially when we have seen a large number of countries are demanding capacity building and, uh, and, and technology transfer uh, uh, um, you know, support. So in IMO, we first started with a global program uh, from our ITCP, we call Integrated Technical Cooperation Program. We allocated funds in the global program to start raising awareness, to begin with the capacity building efforts, and hoping it will take us to the, to the next steps. And what we did initially was <clears throat> to develop a number of training materials, awareness raising materials, developing model courses for the seafarers, uh, or the training academy, so they can train the seafarers, we have developed training package on energy efficient design index, also training package on SEMP. We also have developed a train the trainer tools. Um, in fact, we implemented train the train the program in World Maritime University a few times. So we are slowly trying to build this expertise basis around the world using these tools. So that was our beginning uh, a few years back. Um, and soon we started seeing the interest from the donors and saying, okay, we would like to support. One of the first one came on board was the COICA, the Korean uh, International Development Agency, uh, who um, supported a project in Asia, um, and then came the Global Environment Facility. So this uh, COICA project allowed us to start the process in Asia. And that's a, the map of uh, the shipping lanes in Asia the reds are the ports and the, the whites are the marine protected areas, but you can see how intense the shipping traffic is there. Um, and an intervention in Asia, which where the maritime business is almost, you know, quite kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's concentrated, uh, was a very good start for us. So the COICA money we used to do a number of trainings in Asia and using the training materials that we developed. Soon we came, um, we, we had the funding from the Global Environment Facility. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the GEF. GEF is uh, around a $4 billion Global Environmental Fund for a for period of four years, which then gives uh, funding for many of these global and national projects. We had some success from the GEF in the past in other areas, so Jeff this time supported 
a project um, called Global Maritime Energy Efficiency Partnerships Project, GLOMIT in short. And uh, GLOMIT was launched in uh, September 2015 in a conference in Singapore called the Future Ready Shipping Conference, which we will have again next year, but we launched it in 2015. It's a 13, uh, around $14 million project with a cash contribution of uh, 2 million from the GEF. All of the contributions are coming from the countries who are participating in this project because there was a big commitment from many of these countries to, 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 to do uh, these, these activities. And the main focus on building capacity, uh, technical and op for operational measures, both institutional capacity and human resource capacity, and, and, and that was the main focus. So the countries are um, there, we have 10 countries, we could not go to all the countries around the world, so we chose those countries, we call them lead countries, who have given a commitment that they would um, you know, uh, deliver this milestone of the project, be it regulations, be it policies, and Argentina, you can see the number of countries there, um, range from Argentina uh, all the way to Asia and Philippines here, they are taking a lead in this particular project. Um, the main focus again is legal policy institutional reforms, because without doing that, there's no way they can implement these regulations, so, but they need a help in, the, in that area. Of course, for that we need to build the capacity, and then another important component of the project is the private sector partnership, where we wanted to bring the private sector players to, to go in parallel with this policy regulatory uh, processes in those countries because they are quite connected because you can't have a regulation without consensus with the industry and, and the other way. Um, so this process basically involves the, a review of the national legislations and policies, starting with that, developing a, a strategy and a policy based on the existing situation, moving on to drafting legislations and to develop the institutional reforms and start the implementation. So that's the cycle that we are focusing on. By then, we are doing that through capacity building, provide the countries with the tools and guides, document how to do it, send them uh, experts, and also we partner with organizations such as IMRS and other experts around the world to help these countries to go through the legal policy institutional reforms. It's, it's, it's easier said than done, uh, because it gets in the political regime of many countries and then you know we go to wait many times, so, but that's, that's a tricky process, but that's the a, that's a project focus. The countries who are participating uh, in this project, project have agreed on those milestones that they will form an interministerial task force in those countries, they will draft the um, legislation, they will draft the policies, and if they haven't acceded, they will accede, or they, have, they will start implementation. So that roadmap was agreed right in the beginning before the country started the project. Now, it has been a year now, and what we have done so far, and most important thing, which actually we are very proud to have partnered with IMRS, providing the country with some guide documents, some guidance, some support. I can also see people like Gillian and others here who have contributed as experts, uh, and, and, and also UCL um, and the whole team was involved in, uh, with IMRS support in developing first a, a guide to do a rapid assessment in the country. Where do we stand right now in terms of energy efficiency? Because that is important to know. So this guide provides how do we assess that baseline situation. Then also a guide how do we incorporate this international legislation into a domestic legislation. So there's some guides being developed for that as well. And of course, um, the countries also need to have a game plan how do we implement this convention and how do we make it effective? And that strategy, a guide was developed how to develop a strategy uh, for the purpose. So these are the three guides that we developed in the last few months and we rolled it out to a, a set of selected consultants uh, or experts nominated by the countries who all went to Georgia for a meeting and they have been now trained how to use the guides. Right now they are in the process of going uh, implementing uh, those processes using those guidance documents so all of you can really contributed in helping these countries moving along those lines. Um, the second is straightforward capacity building. Um, training packages, national level training, developing a pool of experts in the countries, 
um, and also some training for port people because ports also play an important role um, and also organizing conferences and forums around the world. Uh, simple capacity building exercises. Um, some of the photos from around the world and the countries are very active in organizing all this. The third component of the project is the Global Industry Alliance that some of you may be very interested to hear about it. Uh, this is, we are trying to bring the industry uh, joining hands with us so that you know, common issues can be discussed, common solutions can be developed and see um, how the industry also can support technology transfer. So the Global Industry Alliance um, um, is, is now being formed in the project. We are looking forward. Uh, we already have a quite a good interest from some of major leading companies, ship owners, as well as some technology providers to join hands in this global endeavor. Um, the first step that we did was developing a global database on energy efficient technologies which was a requirement for IMO to develop such a database and that's what we already done. We are hoping that the GIA will actually start a lot more activities in the near future so that uh, we can ensure a very good cooperation between governments and industry in, in developing joint solutions. So the, the famous um, Glow X model that we use, the, sorry about the small phone, the left side is the legal policy institutional pathway we have a global, a regional, and a national legislative processes. And the right side is the industry participation we are hoping to have soon with the R&D forums, technology information sharing, et cetera, et cetera. So we can actually reduce the barriers for the shipping industry to adopt these technologies. That's a website you may be interested in, the glowmeet.imo.org, um, um, where we have developed this information portal on energy efficiency technologies uh, right now. So it's a wealth of information there um, and you can click on those different boxes there to go into different different areas of energy efficiency uh, and, and, and um, it's heavily <coughs> being used by, by, by many people. So that's one of the deliverables that we have done so far. It's a very useful uh, database that IMO has now compiled um, there. Um, the work in progress uh, in this particular project we are right now focusing also on the ports, uh, because ports also play an important, it's a continuum in the, in the chain of uh, maritime transport, so they also have, can play a role. So we are developing some guides on how the ports can um, uh, do an emission status assessment in the ports, um, and also how to develop a port specific strategy to address the emissions in the ports. Um, port state control is an important element of the enforcement of the regulation, so we are developing workshops uh, and training packages in this area. Also, um, uh, some training packages at the seafarers who have a big role to play as well. Um, now, that was GLOME. And moving on to the next, uh, we wanted to move more towards a global network of a sustainable global network um, of building the capacity and for technology transfer. Um, especially because the short-term ad hoc interventions may not be adequate. There's a huge demand. We can't just do these small, small things around the world. So we need a more innovative models, maybe a global network of institutions, um, and, and uh, so that they can all share their experiences. I just want to start with this little story about myself. I think as some of you have told this before. That is an MRI scan of my brain a few years back where the doctors identified a problem in my brain. Um, you can say there's nothing in there, but there is, <laughs> it's just, the, it's just the, the, the veins. Um, I started really hearing uh, sounds in my ear, and the doctors figured out I have a cross connection back in, my, back in my brain, which would have been very risky for my life. So they said, okay, we can solve it, um, and they did solve it, and that's uh, the, you know, the, the, it, it's clear now, it's, it's gone. It's a, it's a story of the past, I survived, but um, this is a story of technology. When I woke up from my six hour procedure in, in, in here in neurosurgery in, in London, I asked the doctor, if I were born in a different country where I didn't have access to the, a, a, a highly educated doctor and with all kinds of 3D scans and CT scans and everything through which they can do the procedure without an operation, they went through my artery and did everything under the imaging, um, I asked them, would I have survived if I were named? in less developed country and yeah. it's expecting an answer saying probably no, probably it would have been very difficult to do that and they gave me a totally different answer, no, no, we have thought about it, we have trained many doctors in many parts of the world, 
there was a private sector who was interested in, um, in putting in some uh, equip money in equipment. They created little centers where it could serve the region where some of, because this is very rare situations, and they could serve that particular, particular need. Um, it is a very beautiful example of a developed country training a developing country. The private sector putting in some money in, the government initially supported it, and they are now saving lives around the world. So if you, if you see that, the, that life can be saved through such global networks, I'm sure the, our, our, our health of the planet also can be probably, you know, some of this network can, can do. Because the multiplier effect of this global network is, is important. It can kind of bring the exponential growth. It also promotes South-South cooperation, developing and developing and cooperation. And um, it's much more sustainable than individual interventions or centers. Um, I've seen examples around the world. The UNEP has already a CTCN framework under the, under the UNFCCC convention, but mainly uh, for the land-based side. We have World Bank starting climate in centers, and they are establishing these centers around the world, but again focusing mainly on land-based industries. So there isn't much in maritime field, and this is a, uh, an area that we, we explored. And um, the, because of the international nature of the maritime sector, we do need this kind of a specific um, network in the maritime field. And uh, we, we took this idea to the European Union, and they like the idea of, of moving into a more institutionalized approach for capacity building. Trying to focus on Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Latin America, and the Pacific, and we call it the concept of a maritime technology cooperation center network. And these centers become the regional centers of excellence, where they can be the capacity building champions, where they can be the, the centers where they could facilitate or enable, create an enabling environment for technology diffusion, technology transfer, etc., etc. So creating those centers and the network was important to, 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 to institutionalize our, our, our goals. So, um, in fact, um, uh, three of the project members are here uh, with you. Uh, you'll be able to talk to them. The MTCC project team is, is here with us. The overall objective is building capacity, improve energy efficiency so we can reduce emissions and contribute to the fight against climate change. <clears throat> but specifically, we would like to establish five centers around the world, improve the capacities within those countries and the region through the centers, the centers can help us promoting uptake of low carbon technologies. We can also have pilot projects on data collection reporting or technology related pilot projects. So basically the idea is give some money first, seed funding, let them do some activities, let them get their hands dirty, get the experience, so they become the centers of excellence in those respective regions. And then we can expand the network after that. So this is uh, around $10 million we have uh, from this project. Um, and, and the main focus is on those centers at the bottom tier, maritime technology cooperation centers. We will have support of the national governments. It will be hosted by a host institution, be it a university or be it another maritime institutions. They will host the center, which will be staffed by the project for a period of three to four years. Um, they will then reach out to the region. They will try to build the capacity in the region. And we will have a global coordination from IMO headquarters here. This function of the MTCCs are going to be uh, mainly um, capacity building and training to begin with because um, we would train the staff in the center and then they can train others and then they can train others. Um, they can also help with the technology need and market bad analysis in the long run. They can identify the needs of the region or the countries. They can network among these centers around the world. We will bring them together so they can share the experience and, uh, and lessons. They would also be doing some pilot projects on data collection uh, on fuel efficiency and reporting. So the countries now get some experience in data collection from the, from the ships. And we are giving money to the senders to do the pilot projects. They can hopefully get involved in the government uh, work in the policy uh, aspects as well. And, and one of the main uses of the senders that we are seeing is they become some kind of catalyst for bringing technology or, 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 or connecting technology people or industry to technology uh, and providing support services for technology diffusion in those regions. So that eventually would become probably one of the main um, uses or objectives of those centers after doing all the capacity building. Um, we would have the centers established very soon with the staff, uh, with the project funding. 
They will start delivering the capacity building workshops at the regional level and the national levels. They would have one pilot project on technology uptake. We have asked the centers or the bidders to, pro to, to give proposals, what they would like to do, innovative proposals, uh, to facilitate technology related um, you know, or, you know, aspects. Um, definitely they will be doing a pilot project, all the centers will be doing a pilot project on data collection reporting so that they get the experience and all the countries in the region then can learn from the experience so that it can help IMO community in the data collection process. Communication dissemination um, and sustaining the senders into the future, something that the senders have to work on. We are hoping the senders would become self-sustainable in the future. They can offer services uh, if needed to the industry if needed. They can attract more donors you know, if they are successful. So we are hoping once we establish senders, they will continue on into the future and even expand to satellite senders. So this is our uh, great vision of starting from a very small ad hoc interventions in the past moving towards more institutionalized global network of maritime <coughs> technology centers. Um, we are hoping this we will have more than five centers around the world in the future, but we are beginning with five centers around the world, um, and that's just the beginning. So um, we, when we send the uh, expression of interest to host the centers, we received around 54 expressions of interest from around the world. 54 institutions wanted to host it. We then did a short listing, we got around 14, from the five regions, and uh, they were asked to submit the, the full proposals, which they have done with the details of um, um, technologies, what projects they want to do, etc., etc. And uh, we have just finished the due diligence missions to those regions. We know who these institutions are, and we are hoping to have at least two centers contracted and signed by end of this year. And most of the centers we are hoping by February, March, we will have in place contracted, signed. So they are operational, they can stop the centers and they can then work from there. Um, so if you um, need more information, we have the information on this project in the European Commission or European Union project website, also the IMO website. So both information, I, I, I guess I must will be leaving this presentation somewhere so people can actually, even online uh, audience may be able to access those, uh, those links so they can get more information on that. Um, we will be uploading a lot of information on this website uh, very soon. So there is um, a lot of opportunities uh, through these initiatives. Um, one of the immediate opportunities I see is um, if any of you online or, or your industries or companies are interested in looking into this joining IMO through the Global Industry Alliance that we are just about to launch uh, early next year, there is a great opportunity um, we would like to see the champions, the, 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 the industry who is taking these things forward um, with an objective of sharing the, you know, sharing the experiences, also in a way promoting some of the, the, the good examples in, in various regions through the GLOMI project and also through the MTCC project. Because MTCC, the centers, are going to be very interested in looking into technology providers because that's the aim of the centers to, to reduce the barriers of technology transfer and increase technology diffusion. So there is a strategic advantage in looking into joining the Global Industry Alliance. Uh, we might start with a small set of people and, and partners, but we could expand it later on. Consultancy services, we will be continuously looking for experts and consultancies uh, because we have to do uh, deliver a number of activities in both these projects. And uh, something, um, if individually, if you're interested, uh, there is a, a roster in IMO website. We have encourage you to to sign on to the roster so we can look for uh, expertise from around the world, uh, which we actually lack quite a bit uh, in this particular very specific area. So we do need more experts helping us uh, in these areas. Um, we are looking for also for lectures uh, in, in various parts of the world on these two issues. Um, and as I just mentioned, the MTCC project gives a very good opportunity to join hands with the MTCC in those regions. Uh, into the future. So that might be a very strategic opportunity once we we know who the MTCs are going to be. Now we have 14 to be 5 soon and then once the 5 are known it will be good for them to start communicating eventually uh, in the future. Um, we are also planning to organize a number of global forums such as the one that is planning to do is the Future Ready Shipping uh, FRS in Singapore in 2017 that is earmarked for September 25th to 26th uh, next year, 
So uh, this is also where we all the cutting edge discussions will take place. Also, we will have the MTCCs and GLOME project uh, activities at the same time in Singapore. So please keep an eye on that. Um, and also, these projects provide a great platform to promote innovation and technology. So if you're technology developers or if you are interested in collaboration, these projects are a very good vehicle and we are quite open to have any kind of discussions if it is going to help the global community in addressing these issues. Um, so there are opportunities for project partnerships through these projects. Um, GlowMeep is in the halfway through the implementation. We are hoping we will have a much bigger follow-up phase uh, if the donors are interested in the, in, in the results. Um, hopefully we will have a follow-up. The MTCCs is only a beginning, as you can see, you have five centers, and um, we hopefully, I'm hoping um, that will attract more donors to expand the centers around the world. We have a very dynamic team, we're very committed, I'm sure uh, they will take to the end of this project and then it will expand from there. So, some strategic opportunities there, and um, it is, it has, I know it has a very fast paced speech from me, but uh, GlowMeep and MTCC projects are two of our major projects that we are starting. Uh, it will continue on for the next few years. MTCC will be there for another three or four years. Um, and in the meantime, we are also exploring other opportunities with other donors around the world and uh, major global donors to see if we have other interventions possible. Um, so I would like to <coughs> probably... Um, um, summar uh, yeah, I can summarize that MAPO Annex 6 is a key driver uh, for future-ready low-carbon shipping. We have the regulatory regime in place, but implementation is, is another issue. And there's a lot of demand from the developing countries to, for technical cooperation, capacity building, technology transfer. Um, this project, GLOME, and this global network, which we are very excited about, uh, is a very strategic opportunity to catalyze all these efforts. Uh, and we are open for discussions for partnerships, involvement of experts, and uh, any kind of cooperation. And we are all very proud to have IMARS on board already with the GLOMARS, GLOMIP as a strategic partner. Um, and I, we do hope we can enhance. Uh, of course, we already are working with the UZL and also people like Jill, Dr. Gillian here uh, and, uh, and others. So it's uh, already beginning of a, a, a partnership, a, a metastatic partnership. So these are the contacts if you would like to. Um, I, I've been talking about all this, but the real actors are there. Um, Ms. Astrid Dispert, who is heading the GLOMI. Um, Astrid just won an award, a Lloyd's Award, um, or Fathom Award for the energy efficiency area. So you, some of you are familiar with Astrid. Um, Ms. Tamar Barbatse, she, Tamuna, she's here. If you can raise your hand, Tamara. She is the head of the MTCC project. Um, and other general inquiries you can address to me uh, and I know. attention and also the global audience thank you very much the time for any any questions yeah thank you thank you for introducing to us our uh, the IMOS global projects for uh, to address greenhouse gas emissions and for sharing your personal experiences to stress how important is uh, the global cooperation uh, if you wish to take some questions from those being here and online sure definitely I'll be Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Marteka, for coming here and giving this talk to us. I'm Natalia Martini, our Senior Technical Advisor at IMRST. I think I appreciate this talk with Marilyn because I don't think we have many occasions to explain, I think IMO hasn't got many occasions to explain to people how you go from international legislation to effective implementation of the Convention. And I think GLOMIP is an example. You go from international legislation to technology to capacity building and that technology transfer. So um, what I noticed that the model that you use for GLOMIP is very similar to the model that you use for the Palace Water yes. 
and obviously it's been successful so we are repeating uh, the same scheme which is, is very it's very it's excellent what I was wondering is you had a second phase mm -hmm. with your ballast mm -hmm. do you think there would be a second phase with Clomip <coughs> and what and if so, what it would be the focus of yeah. this second? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Natalia. Um, well, Natalia was also one of her colleagues in IMO before, and uh, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, um, yes, we would like to see a much bigger scaled up phase two. Ten mm -hmm. countries and small interventions of two years is a, almost a drop in the ocean. Of course, we are starting somewhere. We are hoping with all this foundation we build, all the tools we develop, it will be much easier for to scale up. We will use these 10 countries as the catalyst to reach out to the region. Now, we are hoping the donors are seeing the importance of this project and the, the contribution that it can make to the climate change uh, issues. Um, and we are hoping we can get some money, uh, might maybe much bigger money to, to scale it up. If we have a project, and I hope there will be, maybe one of the focus is going to be uh, to begin with at least the data collection uh, and reporting aspects of it, because that's one of the important priorities. Yes. Many countries are looking forward to it. Maybe we will, for, can, while we continue the capacity building and training, etc., we may go a much bigger way in helping the country to get the data collection reporting uh, system in place, because without having data information flowing, it will be very difficult to develop future strategies. So that will be one of the focus. Um, GIA will be probably much bigger and expanded, uh, more industry mm -hmm. participation. Um, so, kind of ideas that we are thinking if there's a follow up. I've got another question. Sure, right? sure. And then, <laughs> um, it just mentioned, uh, you know, the, the <coughs> project, the, M the MTCC project. Yeah. Obviously, it's another mm -hmm. step towards a global collaboration. And you show us some example of partnership. Do you think there would be the opportunity for IMERS to? Um, engage in future partnership and if so uh um, so, expand on that because i think yeah. we are all interested to know certainly whether um, this can be carried forward certainly and we have seen a great example of how imo and imaras collaborated to the glow meet um imaras um, was very very helpful in pulling the expertise and the right expertise to help us the guides and etc etc so I don't see um, why MRS couldn't continue the partnership even uh, once we have the MTCC set up. Uh, maybe Tamara can uh, give uh, any ideas, but I have a feeling that IMRS has such a wealth of expertise information in the IMRS network. So we are developing a global network of MTCCs, so you have a global network as well. So there must be some ways of connecting at the local level, region level, the IMRS expertise and the group with the MTCCs to give advice or even to take some projects and get involved in the project. So I can see a lot of opportunities there. It's, it's just a matter of um, once we know the MTCCs and once we know the projects and then see how IMRS can help. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Daniel. Uh, first question from online, if I can ask that. Um, during the presentation, you showed the barriers to implementation yeah. of IMO regulations. And you mentioned about split incentives yes. between stakeholders. Could you explain more about how split incentives work? Sure. Um, should, should I ask this about to say that, but I can actually uh, give a bit of a, or, or, or yourself. Um, it, it is all about, I mean, you know, you have to make an investment in, in technologies or uh, new ships or whatever. Um, now, the fuel is paid by somebody else, which is, I'm just saying an example in this particular case, charters. Um, now, who is benefiting uh, from this investment, you know, from a fuel consumption that may not be directly related to the, the profit coming back to the owner? So one example of the split incentives here, okay, one is putting an investment, but somebody else may be the direct beneficiary of the investment. And it's not sure how the benefits will then be shared. And there is that perception out there, and that probably say it's a it's a real issue as well. Maybe uh, we can also ask somebody from the from the audience. I don't know whether Dr. Rahim, uh, whether you have any comment on that on the split incentives from an industry side. How do you see it? Um, yeah, in uh, thank you. And uh, in many cases, uh, many partners come together and uh, chip in together and develop the technology, but uh, only a few of them may be using it. Yeah, but the others may not be using it. 
but that doesn't mean that they should not be uh, oh, yeah. benefiting, but if not directly, they may be indirectly benefiting at the second stage or the later stages. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in fact, it is actually being considered one of the main barriers, um, uh, the split incentives, and how do you overcome that um, if you were to adopt low carbon technologies? Yeah, but thank you for the question. Very valid one. <laughs> Yes, please. Yeah. And have you looked at other UN bodies uh, that have tried to do something very similar? For example, ICAO or maybe UNF UNFCCC level. Clearly, there were some regulations there that were that also required capacity building yeah. and technology transfer, which is why they've got adopted. Or sure, sure, yeah. Um, ICAO is formerly more like IMO, the recent entrant to the whole uh, debate, and they have a glow uh, similar projects. Um, but more focusing on a particular infrastructure being, I think it's a particular infrastructure being built as a pilot. So it's not, it's not the capacity building type of that we do through training, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a different type of investment. But we have looked into the CTCN concept, the, the UNEP MCCCs and UNEP uh, mechanism, which use a slightly different uh, methodology that they want the countries to come up with the proposals and then they evaluate those proposals and then they fund those proposals. So, um, it's the opposite of what you're doing, it's from the country to work. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, yeah. the country. Um, uh, I mean, here also in the MTCC, is, it's also the, the, the region or the centers are proposing those, uh, yeah, okay. those pilot projects. We are not actually giving any, any recipe. We are okay. actually asking them to submit proposals. But um, here we are trying to establish a regional center of excellence which then can reach out to the region mm -hmm. where those CTCN is a slightly different, is more national focus. Okay. Uh, yeah. But we have looked into it. We are also looking at the World Bank uh, models. <laughs> um, many of those models have lots of merits. Um, some of them may not be directly applicable for a sector like maritime, which is quite diverse in terms of players, uh, in terms of uh, the whole complexity of shipping is a slightly different uh, ball game here. Yes, please. Yeah. Um. My name is Ovidio Alpomi. Um, I would like to know uh, where does uh, the IMO think that the EOI is going in the future? The energy efficiency operating uh, indicator. Well, I have to ask help here uh, because I don't see that being discussed much right now. With that. It's not the focus. As uh, There's a UI calculations and that's for the same. Uh, the discussions are more focused now towards the data collection and reporting and verification and, and, and those areas. So I'm not sure if there is any latest discussion or a discussion how UI will be heading actually, because the, the discussion right now is developing a strategic roadmap, but that is not just focused on the EOI. Anybody else would like to comment on that? EOI, directions of EOI. I, I'm not sure, I don't think there is a specific uh, dialogue happening, how that should or how it should move actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Gary Hayes, H2 Deep. Uh, we've been looking for the last 25 years or so at using hydrogen as a fuel and especially for undersea, so deep ocean, yeah. um, where the oxygen obviously has to be created. So, therefore, splitting water is yeah. the simplest thing and we're using tectonic plate boundaries uh, with the geothermal in our studies to do that. So we've identified a lot of places like Mauritius yep. and Mediterranean. Um, why hasn't that been adopted earlier? Because technology has been there for 100 years. Why isn't hydrogen used as a fuel? For the ships. For the ships. The best person I can actually direct this question is Dr. Rahim, who is actually looking into um, <coughs> into some of these technology areas. Like, would you like to help out, Dr. Him? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. I can help you yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Japan, Klassen K is involved in a series of projects in which uh, it's mainly for the hydrogen transportation. It is, in this case, the hydrogen is not developed from uh, the tectonic plates or something. It is by simple <coughs> yeah, electrolysis. Mm -hmm. And the problem is in countries like Japan, it is prohibitively expensive to produce hydrogen. So as part of that, what we are doing is we are producing where it's, it can easily be done, like in Australia, then uh, liquefied and transferred to Japan. Sure. 
and plus the cost is very low because in uh, Australia there are so many windmills, the wind power generators, mm -hmm. and whenever there is wind, that doesn't mean that they should uh, supply it to the, to the, the what you call the bus or the system. So there is surplus electricity there, so that can be diverted for electrolysis, produce hydrogen, then transfer it to Tokyo or Japan, wherever it is. So we are now working on um, a couple of uh, projects for actually uh, developing a ship. Mm -hmm. And we already approved the cryogenic tanks to do that. So maybe in a couple of years, it will be a reality and we'll soon be issuing a guidelines for hydrogen transportation. It's not production, <coughs> but transportation. transportation. Mm, I see. Yes. Okay. But Alternative fuels is actually part of the big toolkit that we are talking about anyway. I mean, LEDs and biofuels and all these things. And, and we haven't really seen much of development coming through the hydrogen um, use as a fuel yet, but hopefully that, that will be. Yes, please. The last cohort at, from City University, the best student, he ran his um, project for the MSC yeah. on running a ferry on hydrogen, which they are indeed doing up on the Isle of Skye. Mm -hmm. The main problems, the main problem is, is um, getting hold of enough hydrogen, hydrogen. Mm -hmm. and uh, storage capacity in a, in a passenger ferry is, uh, is. A, a, a bit suspect, yeah. but he got the idea from um, jumping onto a, a red bus that was run on hydrogen, hydrogen. that's the way. <coughs> but it is happening, and um, but the volume is the yeah. problem. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can see all of the <coughs> innovative ideas now, now coming up, and, and I think at least the regulatory drivers will actually be the catalyst now to, to, to bring them more to the market now. I think that's uh, still a lot of barriers moving from lab to, lab to big, big scale <coughs> operations, but I think mm. we'll get there. I think there's a great opportunity in lagoons. So if you're building turbine lagoons, which we've been planning to do here for many, many years, oh, okay. um, you're creating a source of hydrogen at source. And yeah. then, of course, you're feeding to the ships from the mm. river. And river barges yeah. can then feed into the ships. You should present this in the future ready shipping conference next year. Yeah, we'll to to ready. Ready. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the new ideas Thank you, for the you would like to, like to bring on board. Yes, of course. Yeah. There are so I mean, many ways. Yeah, if you can uh, chip it a little bit. Yes. Because there are so many ideas. But the thing is, to convert them into reality, that is where people are failing. Yes. Because some of them are viable. Ultimately, it is money. If it is economically viable, yes. and if somebody is able to make a profit, yeah. everybody will be jumping into that. So, but that's, unless that, you're that's a key. company. Typical, that's a key, yes. <laughs> typical story of the technology curve and the end of the value of death, and that's yes. it. So, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yes, Daniel, and, and, and it's above, yes. Uh, one more from online. Yes. Um, I guess these are probably yet to be announced, but where are these centers of excellence okay. located? Mm -hmm. um, maybe not location-wise, but are they also, are they going to be, for yeah. example, in academic establishments okay. as universities or with organizations being closer to, say, the practical world? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah um, a lot of this information is now in the public domain where IMO had issued a circular letter that showed the shortlisted entities. And uh, for example, in, um, I think it is open in the domain. Uh, in, 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 um, in the Caribbean region, we have uh, uh, Trinidad and Tobago and, and Jamaica as the two countries who are shortlisted institutions there. One is a university, one is a regional maritime institution. Um, in, in Latin America, we have a university from Ecuador and we have uh, from Panama, another regional university. Africa, we also have a university from Kenya, then an institution in, in Namibia. We have Asia from China and uh, Malaysia. Um, many of them are actually, and, and we have Pacific also universities uh, trying to hold. So a lot of them are actually a, a universities with a regional dimension. Um, uh, with uh, some kind of exposure to maritime side. So that's kind of a, you know, but there is an IMO circular that actually gives the shortlisted 14 entities um, who have been shortlisted to be the final, and, and we will have five of them 
and we are very encouraged that we have very good, very good uh, interest and very good proposals and very good ideas that are being proposed as pilot projects. Yeah. So yeah, we are not going to build uh, bills and mortars yeah, from the you know we are not going to build new buildings and all that. We are going to piggyback on an existing university or institution um, who has a capacity to host a center and who can govern it um, and, and then sustain it into the future. So that's that's a, that's the idea. Yeah, Isabel. Thanks. I was just wondering if you might be able to share with us what kind of um, technology pilot projects the shortlisted shortlisted um, entities are looking at. Um, there you got me. That's a bit of a confidential information right now, mm -hmm. which we are not at the liberty of opening up right now. So once we have the centers in place, we may be a bit more liberty to to say what they are. It's actually going through a procurement process, so I think it would be probably a, you know, a bit too early to, to <laughs> disclose that. Sorry about it. Sorry, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are hoping that all the centers will be contracted out in the next three, four months' time. So then it's a, it's a bit of a competition going on, so it's probably fair to yeah, yeah. give that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we exhausted all the questions and in time to conclude, uh, that was a time given to me, but thank you very much all of you for your listening um, and all the questions and also the global audience, thank you uh, for joining from around the world. And thank and you, Aymar. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Southeast England and London home counties, we have prepared a certificate of appreciation to you. Oh, thank you. Um, oh. uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you those attending online. Certificates of attendance are available for those interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please do contact us if you have any further queries, partnership interest, I did. Whatever. Thank you. <laughs>